Well, hello and welcome again to our online Bible study that we call God's Message to the Church in These Last Days. I just felt led by the Holy Spirit that I need to drill down more on what I guess you'd call Christianity 101, the very essentials. I think the Holy Spirit is impressing upon me the importance of these in these last days. So we'll be backing up and revisiting some of the things that we've mentioned before, but drilling down a little bit deeper into some of these issues because I think this is so important in the world in which we're living. So Father, as we begin this study, I, I just pray, Lord, that you would speak to me and through me and that it would not be my words, but it would be your words. I pray, Lord, that you would guide every word that I say. And I pray, Lord, that there would be ears that would hear and listen and apply what is being said to their own individual life and to mine as well. Because I'm not just preaching to the crowd, I'm preaching to myself. I need it as much as anybody. So Father, forgive us and cleanse us and draw us closer to you each and every day. And Father, I commit this time to you that you would have your will and your way in everything that is said and everything that is done. And may you have all the glory and the praise. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, this past weekend, of course, we had the inauguration. And there were some things that really, you know, it, it amazed me in one respect. It was an answer to prayer in another respect. But it was also a challenge because we are living in the last days and we are not just fighting against flesh and blood, but we're fighting against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. As we get closer and closer to the coming of the Lord, the enemy is going to have an all-out attack upon everything that is godly and everything that deals with our Christian life. And it behooves each and every one of us to get back to the basics. And in one sense of the word, I feel like, is this just too little too late? Have we crossed over the brink? Is there any hope? But in the Another way of looking at it, the Lord says we're to work while, the, while we have the opportunity. That we're to do everything that we can as long as we can. So, in that respect, I have to say, okay, we'll keep on digging, we'll keep on teaching, we'll keep on trying to share the word, we'll keep on praying, we'll, we'll do what we can. But getting back to the inauguration, it was just amazing that there were so many ministers that were involved in the inauguration that was unprecedented. And they were from different backgrounds and represented different, different segments of the faith community, whether it was Catholics or whether it was Pentecostals or mainline Christianity or the Hispanic community. It was just a broad cross-section of Christianity across the country, as well as a Jewish rabbi. And I really appreciated uh, his words that he said as well. But one thing that I noted was that they all ended their prayer in Jesus' name. And I was telling some folks that Years ago, when I was still working at one of the locations in the county, 
that we had had a covered dish dinner and they asked me to return thanks. And so I did. And I ended my prayer, of course, in Jesus' name. And then later that afternoon, I was called into the HR manager's office. And the HR manager and I had worked together on many projects, so I didn't really think a whole lot about it. But uh, I was just floored when I was told that someone had, um, had been concerned that someone might be offended by my prayer when I ended it in Jesus name and I was thinking about that and I was thinking about Peter and John when they were called before the authorities because they had healed a lame man in the name of Jesus and they were preaching and teaching in Jesus name and so they were being intimidated and threatened by the authorities and we're being told specifically, do not teach or preach in the name of Jesus. But Peter stood his ground and he says, we cannot, you be the judge of what's right or wrong. But as for us, we cannot help but preach those things that we've seen and heard. So they did not back down and they continued to speak out in the name of Jesus. They continued to heal in the name of Jesus. And even if it meant that they had to go to prison, even if it meant that they were threatened by those in authority, even though they were intimidated or people tried to intimidate them, they stood their ground. They were bold. They were courageous. They did not cave in to the pressures that the world was trying to put upon them. And I'm just thinking about our society and our church and how our church has caved in to political correctness and that we've been so afraid to even say Merry Christmas. My goodness, that's a terrible thing, isn't it, to say Merry Christmas. We've been afraid to speak the name of Jesus. We've been afraid to pray in our school or read our Bibles or take our Bible to work. We have uh, been those silent majority for so long that we've allowed prayer and Bible reading to be taken out of our public life. But I think about the words of Jesus, how we are to take up our cross and follow Him even if it means that we lose our jobs, even if it means that we may face persecution, even if it means that we may be arrested, even though it means that there will be difficulties in our lives as a result of it. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you have to count the cost and you have to pay the price sometimes. But the rewards are eternal. We may not always see it in this world, but we have to lay up those treasures in heaven. And so when I think about Christianity 101, I'm thinking about, well, the church really hasn't been taught Christianity 101. We haven't made disciples. We've made people that just fill up a pew and who call themselves Christians, but basically lives and acts just like the rest of the world. We pursue the things of the world just like everybody else. We watch the same movies, we watch the same programming, we watch uh, the talk shows just like everybody else, and we are inundating ourselves with the things of the world and yet the Bible says that we're to come out from among them and be separate. But you know, even the Hebrew people, they didn't like to be different. That's why they were calling out, give us a king, we want to be like everybody else. And Samuel was so upset because Israel had never had a king before. God had always been the ruler 
of the nation, the one that was in charge. But they wanted to be like everybody else. And I think that's where we have uh, found ourselves in the church in the 21st century is that we are now, we have not been the salt of the earth. We haven't been that preservative. And so our society and our nation has gone pretty much down the tubes. I, as the inauguration took place and, you know, it, in some respects it was like, okay, this is a new day. We've got a new administration. Maybe there's hope for our nation. Maybe we can start rebuilding our nation and making it great again. And that's, that's the hope and that's the dream of a lot of people. But following the inauguration was a woman's march on Washington, D.C. And there were those that went to see what was going on at this woman's mat, um, march in Washington. And I was listening to a report yesterday. And they said that they were there and they were watching the women as they marched through the streets. And they said it was totally vulgar. That it wasn't that the women were marching for equal rights or for better pay or anything of that nature. It was totally vulgar. And the person that was reporting on this actually was very graphic in telling what the people were saying, what the, some of the women were saying and doing. There was a, a woman that bore her chest and started speaking ungodly words coming out of her mouth. Sexual uh, allusions, you know, in a very graphic manner. And so the ones that were there observing and trying to provide a, a witness to these people, they said, you know, what you really want is sex without any consequences. You want abortions. And they said, yeah, that's right, that's right. And that's what they were promoting. And I won't even speak the words that they were saying. It was so vulgar. And I was thinking, man, how did we get in this condition? How, how did women get to this place in our country that they would talk like this and act like this? Even before little children. And then I was thinking about how this past weekend also that there were severe storms that emerged there in the southeast. Mississippi and Florida, Georgia uh, particularly, there were tornadoes and wind gusts and, and just flooding and damage billions of dollars, people's lives that were killed or injured as a result. And I was looking at weather.com and reading some of the reports and it said a little girl was asking their parent, is God mad at us? And I guess my answer is, unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yes, God is angry with the filth, with the pornography, with the sexual degradation, the depths that we have, you know, gone to in our culture, coming, spewing out of Hollywood, spewing out of the celebrities. They said even Madonna was came over and she was even making statements that she later said, oh, you know, I didn't really mean what I was saying, you know, about uh, destroying the White House. But, you know, and I was thinking, how, how has our society gotten into this shape? And then I was thinking about Sodom and Gomorrah, and I was thinking about how the Lord appeared to Abraham 
and was telling, it, he came with two angels to let Abraham know what was coming, the judgment that was coming on Sodom. And then Abraham began to intercede on behalf of Sodom because his nephew was there. And he kept making a deal with God, so to speak. And he was saying, well, if there's 50 that righteous people there, will you not destroy it for the sake of 50? Or what about 45? Or what about 40? Got down to 10 and he stopped at that point. He thought at least Lot and his family could maybe be enough that would save that city. But unfortunately, you know, the angels... When they went to Sodom, where did they find Lot? Now the Bible says that Lot was a righteous man, but where did the angels find Lot when they came to Sodom? It said that he was sitting at the gate. And we read that and not understanding the culture, we might not know what that means. But what that meant is that Lot was in a position of authority in that city. In other words, he was in the government. The gate is where they did their business. The gate is where they brought judgment. So he had a high position in that city. He was sitting at the gate. He was one of the officials. And unfortunately, even though he was as the Bible describes him, a righteous man, he really had not had an impact or an influence on his own family. Because the angel said, you need to go and talk to your family members and get them out of here. So when Lot went to speak to his sons-in-law, they thought he was talking like a crazy man. And they wouldn't even listen to him. So Lot, the only ones that he was able to get out of there was his two daughters, unmarried daughters, and his wife. But we know that the pull of the city and the world was so entrenched in his wife, she didn't want to let it go. She lagged behind. She was dragging her feet. And some believe that it was probably a volcano that erupted. And some of the volcanoes, if they were to erupt, they could be deadly today. Uh, they have so much power and so much energy. And if they erupted, they would spew forth uh, ash and sulfur into the atmosphere that could be deadly. And this is exactly what happened to Lot's wife that it was just a deadly, deadly thing. She lagged behind. She could not get out of the, the uh, spew of the sulfur and the ash and all that came out of the city. And so she turned into what the Bible describes as a pillar of, of salt. But she was just disintegrated by what happened. And even his two daughters, you know, well, let me back up. The angel said, go into the hill, go into the mountains, because we can't do anything until you get out of here. Well, Lot didn't want to go up into the mountains. He was used to the city life now. You know, Abraham chose, even though Abraham at 75 years old, when he left Ur of the Chaldees, he knew wealth. He knew what it was to live in a fine house. But the Lord called him to leave everything behind and go to the land that God would show him. And Abraham chose to live in tents. Even though he was a wealthy man, he could have built him a fine house. But he, was, he remained mobile. Because he never knew where God may call him to go or where he wanted him to be. So he just chose to continue to live in a tent. Now it's a fine tent, don't get me wrong. But 
he could have lived in a fine house, but he didn't. But Lot was living in a house in Sodom. So he was used to the comfort, the creature comforts. And he didn't want to give that up. So he was trying to negotiate with the angels and saying, can I go to this little town up here? Can I live there? And the angel said, okay, but get out of here. We can't do anything until you leave. Well, when Lot saw what was happening to Sodom, he decided, uh-oh, I think I better do what the angel said originally. And he went up into the mountains. And he had all he had was his two daughters. And just to show that Lot, who the Bible describes as a righteous man, how he did not have an influence even on his own family, the scripture says that the two daughters were thinking, well, up here in these mountains, there's nobody around. We, we can't find a husband up here. So they decided, let's just get our father drunk and let's uh, have sex with him. And let's have children by our father. And that's exactly what they did. They got their father drunk. And they became pregnant. Both of them. By their father. And they became the Moabites. And the Ammonites. That we read about in the Bible. That was their descendants. They settled on the eastern side. Of the Jordan River. Eventually. And... Today, you would call them the Jordanians. So they are on the other side of the river from Israel. And so here was Lot who could not even have an impact or an influence on his own family. And who had incest with him. And had children by their father. And this is where we're at in our country today. And when I got up this morning, I had a, well, I have some alerts on my uh, Android. And, and so I was, I was looking at it and, and uh, it was showing a video of David Wilkerson. Now he's dead now, but he's the one that started Teen Challenge. And uh, he was very prophetic as he was even up to the time of 9-11, he was given prophecies about what would happen. And he also mentioned Isaiah 9, chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, just like Jonathan Kahn did about the towers falling. But David Wilkerson saw visions of the future. And so I was playing a little bit of the video, and he was talking about the day when there would be such gross immorality and pornography in our country and that there would be persecution of Christians and as Isaiah said that they would be saying good is evil and evil is good I know that those who participated in the inauguration those ministers I know that they probably received death threats. I know that they were there were those that were protesting against them. I'm sure that they received a lot of hate mail. But in these days in which we're living, we are going to face persecution as Christians. The gospel of Jesus Christ for you to for us to proclaim it is going to take a lot of backbone. It's going to take a lot of spiritual fortitude, if you will. We're not living in a time where we can just be casual about who we are as Christians. We must be intentional. And we must be committed. And we must decide just as Joshua told the people of his day, and just like Elijah told the people of his day, you need to choose this day. Who are you going to serve? 
Are you going to stand up for what you believe? Are you going to sit there and be silent and not speak out? Are you going to live in fear and cower down to the threats and the intimidation of the world that's around us? Are we going to stand strong against the forces of darkness that is wanting to take over the world? Yes, God is angry with us as a people. Just as a little girl said, but not that he's angry at that little girl. Unfortunately, the righteous sometimes has to suffer, suffer right alongside of the wicked. Unfortunately. But God has to shake us up. Because we have been so complacent. He cannot allow. It's like a cancer. And the cancer cells are growing and multiplying. And they're becoming more and more deadly. And if we don't remove those cancer cells. Then a person will die. Well the same thing is happening to a nation. When it allows its moral and and spiritual character and nature to become more and more corrupt and defiled. If we don't remove that cancerous spirit, then it's going to destroy all of us. And yes, judgment is coming to America. But I'm calling, and I know that God is calling, not just me. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to be a vessel of the Lord. And just saying that the Lord is saying, now is the time. As I've said many times, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness to all the world, and then the end shall come. But the preaching of the gospel in these end times is not without cost. It's not without a commitment on our part. It's not going to happen automatically. And we just can't sit back and expect it just to be by osmosis. It has to be very intentional. And are we a soldier of the cross? Are we part of the army of the Lord? The Bible says that we're to fight the good fight of faith. That we're to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand the wiles of the enemy. But too many of us do not have the basics. We do not have what we need. We're not equipped for the battle. You know, if you send a soldier out to war, you don't send them out there without first training them and preparing them for what they're going to face. Without giving them resources. Without putting them through exercises so that they can strengthen their bodies to withstand if they have to walk or run for miles to have the stamina to do warfare. But the same is true spiritually as well. So what does it mean to truly follow Jesus? What does it mean to be His disciples? Well, think about the disciples, Peter and John and uh, James and Andrew and, and the Apostle Paul as well. What did it mean for them to truly follow Jesus and to be His disciples? And He said to them, You are to go into all the world and not just make people that sit in a pew and go to a church, but you are to make them disciples. So there's a difference between just being a pew warmer and being a disciple. It means that there has to be a radical transformation in our lives. What does it entail to be a disciple 
of the Lord. And as I was telling some people, you know, when I was in my 20s and I was being challenged in my own spiritual life, and I asked myself the question, how can I be a Christian and never have read the Bible all the way through? How can I call myself a disciple of the Lord if I haven't done that? I think of the words that the Lord spoke to Joshua in chapter 1 of Joshua, where he says, the Lord said, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. That's a full-time job right there. Just reading and meditating on the Word of God day and night. Yet how many of us do that in our daily walk with the Lord? How many of us have read the Bible? Do we even know? You know, it's kind of funny. You know, today, if we want to know the answers, all we do is Google it, right? We just get on Google. If we want to know an answer... Instead of searching it out for ourselves, instead of us doing the research, instead of us meditating, instead of us praying and say, Lord, reveal this to me or help me or show me, we just say, oh, I, I can Google it. You know, we just want to take the shortcuts. But the Bible says, search. Search the Scriptures. We are to seek the Lord. Jesus compared it in His parables. He was saying, you know, that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like a treasure that's hid in a field that a man will go and start digging until they find it. Dig deep. Dig deep. Keep on digging until they find that treasure. If you knew there was a treasure buried in your backyard, what would you do? Or he said it's like a pearl of great price that you would sell everything that you had to acquire it. The kingdom of heaven is something that is so precious and so valuable, and yet the Lord says, I'm not going to give it to you unless you're looking for it. He says, otherwise you will not value it. You know, sometimes you give someone a gift or a present, presents, a present and they don't realize the value of that. You don't know how much you spent on it then they don't treasure it the way that you would have because you knew what a sacrifice it was for you to purchase that. But that's the way it is with the Word of God and with what God has done for us. He says, this is a valuable, precious jewel and you must treasure it and you must seek after it and you must value it. And of course you see some other things that are listed there as far as making disciples. What does that mean, making disciples? It means that you just can't have someone pray a sinner's prayer and that's it. You know, that was one thing that my mother, she always wanted us to go to the revivals and we would go. And, and uh, of course she was Baptist and I'm not throwing off on them at all. But at that time, you know, they were emphasizing salvation and uh, you know every ser every uh, service that I went to you know they always had a salvation message and I'm not throwing off on that don't misunderstand me but my question was okay now that I've done that what next what do I do now and I was looking for those answers because I didn't know what I was supposed to do at that point yeah, I go to Sunday school, do this, do that. But what does it mean to make a disciple? And for Jesus, he chose 12, you know. He spent time in prayer. And he chose 12 who were very ordinary people. He wasn't looking for those with wealth or power or, you know, what the world might choose. But he just chose fishermen and tax collectors and just a variety of people that he chose, just from the common horde, you might say. But he spent 24-7 with them, just teaching them, training them, modeling for them what it means to...
to live out the life that God is wanting us to live. So he provided the example and he provided the teaching. And he, he, he was equipping them before he ever sent them out. But there's other things as far as worship. A lot of people don't know how to worship. They're so afraid of what somebody might say about them. Afraid that people will criticize them. That they don't know how to worship like David did. He danced before the Lord with all his might. Now I admit that there are those that go to an extreme. But just because there are certain people that goes to the extreme in something, that doesn't mean that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. We should do it in a proper manner, yes. But we should do it from the heart. And we should do it with all that is within us. You know, that we should worship the Lord and get down with God, you know. To say, God, I worship you. I praise you. I just glorify your name. I just want to be in your presence. I want to feel your presence. I want to know your will. I, I lift you up, Lord. You are Almighty God. Thank you for what your son Jesus Christ did as he went to the cross and died for my sins. Thank you, Lord, for the abundant life that you have given to me. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. We just need to pour out our worship and our adoration and our praise. And, and if we don't know the right words to say, use the Psalms. Because this was the worship book of the Hebrew people. This is what they used as they sang their hymn. They sung these Psalms. That was the words that they sang. I will give thanks. I will sing of the Lord. I will sing of His mercies forever. And then praying without ceasing, to pray in the Spirit, to pray without ceasing, to, to always have that dialogue going with the Lord in our hearts. We don't always have to speak it forth, which, but it is good if we speak it forth because our words have power. And we need to plead the blood of Jesus over our homes, over our family, over our churches, over our communities, over our state, over our nation, over the world. Because if we don't pray for these things, then yes, the devil's going to take them over. And we cannot be blessed if our nation is not blessed. And our world, if it's not blessed, we're going to have conflict and trouble and, and issues that will emerge. So yes, praying without ceasing. And then deeds of mercy and kindness, just showing forth, you know, uh, giving and helping the poor and the needy and the widow and the fatherless, the orphans, to reach out to people who are suffering, who have lost loved ones, etc., etc. Wherever the Lord, whatever the Lord prompts you to do as an act of mercy and kindness to another person. And yes, assembling together. You know, the, the Jews, they don't have just one worship service a week. They have morning and evening prayers that they can do in their synagogues every day. And the Jews uh, have a saying that if two or more of you are sitting around and you're not discussing the Torah, then you're doing what it says in Psalm 1 where it says, Blessed is the man that seateth, sits not in the seat of the scornful. They say if you're not discussing the Torah, then you're sitting in the seat of the scornful. You know, instead of sitting around and gossiping, instead of sitting around and griping and complaining, are we sitting around and just digging deep into the treasures that are ours that God has made available to us? In his word. I just love to dig deeper. And, and receive a fresh revelation. And it seems like. The more I seek. The more I. The Lord reveals to me. Some hidden treasures. That are in his word. And. 
how can we apply it in our everyday life? But the assembling of ourselves together to encourage, to edify, to strengthen, to uh, fellowship with one another, to love one another, to value one another, to support one another. That is so important. You know, Jesus said, where two or more of you are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of you. So it doesn't have to be a crowd of people. It can just be two or three gathered together in His name. It can be a home. It can be a family. It can be friends. But the assembling of ourselves together, the Bible says, don't forsake that, especially as you see the day of the Lord approaching because it's going to be necessary that we join our hearts and hands together with other believers in these very perilous times that we will be facing. Notice what Jesus said to His disciples in Luke chapter 14. He said, Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You know, to bear our cross. You know, I was thinking about that. What did it mean for Jesus to bear His cross? And I was thinking about the night before, and He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it said He was praying until there were great drops of blood that was just flowing out of His skin. Everything that was within Him resisted what he was about to endure. He despised the shame, but most of all, he despised the fact that his father would turn his back on him and pour out his wrath upon him. He had never been separated from his father. Never, never, never. And even though his father was still there at the cross, he still cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Of course, that was from Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. But that's what he was experiencing and feeling at that moment as a human being. Feeling being forsaken. It means that we have to deny our own will because Jesus had to come to the point that, said, that he had to say, Not my will, Lord but your will be done. I don't want to go through this. I don't want to endure this. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to experience this. But if it's for the greater good, and if it's to um, fulfill your purposes, then yes, I'll do it. But I need your power. I need your strength to do it. I can't do it by myself. Yes, we have to come to that place where we deny our flesh. We have to deny ourselves. And we have to bear that cross. And that cross for Jesus meant that He was spat upon. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. He was... His, his back was shredded to pieces. His feet and his uh, hand, wrist. They were, had the spikes drilled into them or nailed into them. The spear thrust into his side. Yeah, it's painful. Bearing the cross is painful. Being a disciple of Jesus is not for sissies. It's not for the weak-hearted. It's not for the complacent. It's not for the selfish. It's not for those that are only concerned about their own creature comforts. It's for those who are looking to the greater good. How can I further the kingdom of God? How can I fulfill my destiny and my purpose and the reason that the Lord put me here upon this earth. So whoever does not bear his cross and come after me 
follow in his footsteps, cannot be my disciple. So Jesus said, you need to count the cost. You need to, I need to count the cost. We all need to count the cost. And are we willing to take up that cross? If it means we lose our jobs, if, we, if it means that people will misunderstand us, people may say things about us, they may say we're crazy, they may insult us, they may criticize us, they may do even worse. Like I said, for those that stood up at the inauguration and were praying in Jesus' name, we don't know what went on behind the scenes. We don't know what death threats they received. We don't know what, um, what dastardly things people were trying to do to them to, to prevent them from participating and for standing up for the Lord. We don't know the price that they had to pay. We just look at them and say, oh well, they they, you know, they were able to handle that real well. We appreciate all that, but we, we really don't know the depths that they went through to be where they were on that platform. The price that they had to pay. Are we willing to pay the same price in our lives? You know, here's the thing where it says in Second Chronicles, and we were talking about, you know, the little girl this past weekend with all the tornadoes and severe, severe weather that was in the southeast of our country. And she was saying, is God mad at us? Well, you notice the words here, if, if. If who? If the nation? No. If my people who are called by my name. That's talking about the church. That's talking about the body of believers. But what does it say? Will humble themselves. Let me try to zoom in on those words here. Will humble themselves and pray. And seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. It's not talking about the world. The world does what the world does. Sinners do what sinners do. They're wicked. They're evil. So we can't point our fingers at them because they're just doing what comes naturally to them. This is talking to us. Are we willing to humble ourselves and pray. Wow. Are we not praying? And seek my face. Is that not what we've been doing? And turn from our wicked ways. Because we have become more and more like the world than the world becoming more and more like us. So it's a word for us church. It's time to get back to the basics, to Christianity 101. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we do humble ourselves before you. We acknowledge that we're the problem. It's not the world. Sinners do what sinners do. But the church has not been what you've called us to be. We've not been truly your disciples. We haven't counted the cost. We haven't taken up our cross and followed after you. So, Father, bring conviction in our own hearts and forgive us for our wickedness of not being your kids, not being what you've asked us to be. So forgive us, Lord. And we are asking... <clears throat> that you would be with us in these perilous times as we face the challenges of the days in which we live. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.